Thanks. Thanks everybody for attending. So I'm going to speak today about co-packaged optics and talk about it as part of our connected future. And I'll begin with some motivation and try to put co-packaged optics in the context of the overall evolution of IO and then look at some of the specific applications where co-packaged optics are likely to start having an impact sooner and some later. And we'll talk about the challenges and opportunities for co-packaged optics and some of those, some of those different applications. Um, it's a hot area and you'll see, you'll see my perspective come out through the talk. We'll see that, you know, that, that there's some, it's, there's a lot of uh, re research and development going into it, a lot of emphasis, lots of excitement around it. Justifiably, it's an exciting technology. But you know, we, it's important to recognize where there are roadblocks and thereby identify the appropriate use cases for co-packaged optics. So hopefully that's something you'll get out of the talk. And then the last part of the talk, I'll talk about um, some work on co-optimization of optics, electronics, and packaging, which I think is really important to enable this uh, technology to have an impact going forward. We'll start with the motivation. Obviously, I, I, I always tell uh, my my students that I, I hate these slides about the never-ending growth of data traffic, but needless to say, we won't be satisfied till every flat surface and every room and every building is papered with 3D high def video and cameras. Uh, so that's driving a tremendous amount of data traffic. Um, and data transmission networks today account for estimated one to one and a half percent of global electricity use. And they represent about 1% of energy related greenhouse gas emissions. Actually, those numbers are very low. I remember the numbers were similar five to 10 years ago when I first started looking at them and they were forecast to increase dramatically. And it's only through the really hard work of smart people like you that those numbers have held constant, which is great. And it's gonna to continue to be a challenge for, the, for all of us to keep it constant into the future. So I think an important point is to remember is that all this data traffic, whether the endpoints are separated by kilometers of optical fiber or meters of copper cable, or in some cases, just a fraction of a millimeter printed wiring, the start and the endpoints are and will be silicon chips. Right? I mean, that's where we've got memory, we've got tremendous computational capability, tremendous infrastructure for CMOS fabrication. So if you were to be able to trace a bit in its long journey from endpoints, right? We usually think of communication, we usually think of our phones, right? We usually think of that last hop, the wireless link to my laptop or whatever it is. But really that's just the last hop in a long journey where the, the data is traversing into some network. Typically there's some optical fiber carrying it into some compute infrastructure, data centers, which is called data centers um, as a shorthand really for a lot of different types of infrastructure computing. And then once it's there, it bounces around back and forth dozens of times into storage, out of storage, do some processing on it, put it back in storage, and then produce a result, send it back out again over the network. Um, and so in fact, up to 76% of all data center internet traffic traverses internally within the data centers. So there's some source for that. Actually, I believe the, number, the fraction is actually higher. I'm sure it depends how you count, what kind of link, what kind of hops of data you actually count in that number. I actually think it's a much higher fraction than that. Um, so that's a tremendous driver. Just the explosion of interconnect within the data center is now the leading market force that drives R and D and connectivity in general. But another one is, is the continued rollout of wireless networks like rollout of 5G has meant, you know, a continued increase in the number of users and the bandwidth delivered to those users has motivated the placement of application specific compute close to these endpoints of data. So you'll see remote compute sites, more of them sprinkled about geographically, not just the few massive data centers, but you've got compute all over the place to provide in the end, better user experience for all of us. Um, so that's also creating new applications for high speed connectivity, right? You've got compute out here. It's got to talk back to larger infrastructure. Um, so all these new applications emerging, it's all driving or fueling R&D and optics. There's some other sort of mega trends that I want to highlight before that, that really set the stage for co-packaged optics. Another important big trend to be aware of is this trend towards disaggregated computing. So if we look at traditional siloed based compute architectures, essentially you've got these cards, these boards, each one's a computer on its own. It's got compute, it's got storage, memory, um, and then it needs some connectivity to talk into a network. So this makes a lot of sense because then 
processors can fetch and store data in and out of storage and memory quickly and with low latency because it's co-located right there. Um, but on the other hand, you can imagine that when you roll this out over a massive data center, you've got very diverse kinds of compute workloads going on. Uh, it's very hard to make that efficient. There's going to be some compute tasks that are memory intensive, others that require much less latency, uh, much less memory and storage to perform. So you're going to be over provisioned somewhere. And estimates are that with that, this current architecture, that there's 30 to 35 percent of memory that just typically sits there unused in a typical uh, data center. That's actually not bad when you think about the diversity of tasks that are going on there. But still, that's a lot of mem money spent on memory that's not being used. On the other hand, if you switch to this disaggregator, the trend now is to look at these disaggregated architectures where you've got clusters of storage, uh, compute, accelerators, memory, and they're interconnected by a network, an interconnect fabric, connectivity that's so high performance, so high bandwidth, so low latency that it performs seamlessly, just like the one on the left, but allows you to redistribute, reallocate resources according to compute workloads. That's obviously really attractive. And it's great if you're someone like me that works on connectivity because it's basically saying, let's take that money that we used to spend on unused memory and storage and instead let's invest it on a better interconnect infrastructure that enables this disaggregated architecture. So again, it, a, this shift creates a sort of step change increase in the emphasis, the importance of connectivity in the performance of these things. So high bandwidth, low latency connectivity here this is a key enabler, and, and we'll see that co-packaged optics is a key part of that. And the other thing is the emergence of a new design paradigm for complex electronic systems. It's using chiplets. So chiplets are essentially, if you haven't heard the term, they're individual dyes that can be co-packaged side by side and sold in combination in a single package as a single chip and behaves like a single chip. Obviously, in order to behave like a single chip, that's going to rely on a fabric of dense high-speed interconnect between the chiplets. And this is something that's been happening inside of a few large companies for quite some time already. If you follow this area, you will know about AMD's efforts and Intel's efforts and Apple's efforts in this area. But what's exciting is that there's growing momentum and a growing ecosystem to support the democratization of this technology to the, across the whole industry. There's massive push for this as tape out costs and the most advanced CMOS technologies continue to increase. For example, in the past year, we saw for the first time wide acceptance of a standard that could govern this die -to, these die-to-die -die interfaces. It's called Universal Chiplet Interconnect Express, UCIE standard. If that sounds reminiscent of PCIE, it's not an accident. There's some uh, shared history there. Um, and so the potential benefits of this new chiplet design paradigm are, are many for the whole industry. It offers the potential for lower cost because by having many smaller dies instead of one giant die, you're going to get better die yield. It's going to allow you to use older technologies for some parts of the system, which will be cheaper to design and fabricate. Uh, it'll let you implement new functionalities in, all inside a package by combining different technologies, using different technologies for what they're best suited for. By allowing companies to use pre-validated chiplet designs, it's going to accelerate time to market for some really complicated systems, right? You're going to be able to grab at least the pieces you need off the shelf. People are doing that today by using IP blocks, but in principle, it'll be even quicker if you have a completely pre-validated chiplet with a standardized interface to mix and match and go to market with one of these. So it's really going to open up innovation to more, more players. So very exciting. There's a lot of momentum behind this. Um, and uh, it's really a big, uh, a big trend that, we'll see factors into co-packaged optics really relies on multi-chiplets in a package. You've also seen at the same time an increased use of optical cables and getting those optics closer and closer to the endpoints of the data. So historically, we might interconnect computers and racks to each other with copper cables. You can interconnect them to a switch, for example, that then routes data traffic to other racks. Usually those are ethernet links. And then the data gets aggregated into higher data rates and flows over longer distances up to a few kilometers. So traditionally, the optics, uh, optical links are reserved for the longer reaches with the higher bandwidths are required. But as overall network traffic increases and data rates increase, the use of optics is percolating into shorter reaches into the rack. And that's a, a trend that the natural extension of which would be 
bringing the fiber even closer to the endpoints of data, bringing it right next to the CPUs, the GPUs, the switches themselves. And that's where, that's where co-packaged optics come in, right? So we've, we've already got, even in, even in a picture like this, where we have optical cabling connecting servers in a rack, you've, you, you've, got, you've already got a combination of optical and electrical links there, right? You've, you've still got to have these little pale blue boxes that are essentially doing the optoelectronic conversion for you and still result in an electrical link here. And the intention is, look, if we just bring the optoelectronic conversion right next to the endpoint, we can eliminate the need for an intervening receive and retransmit chip there that is not insignificant in terms of cost and power consumption. Um, so that's the high level goal and motivation. That's how it supports a lot of megatrends. Um, but there's a lot, of, a lot of challenges along the way. So again, just in summary of this section, big trends we've got, first of all, this, this trend towards disaggregated compute, which relies even more on high performance interconnect, uh, the rise of this chiplet design paradigm and a whole ecosystem around it that's going to allow for mix and match all in a package. You've got this desire to move, bring optics closer to the endpoints of data. And then all this rides on the train of CMOS scaling, right? That, that kind of didn't bother wasting a slide on that, right? CMOS scaling now in three nanometer, now going to nanosheet transistors this year, um, uh, you know, has been fueling this as an underlying force driving that. And, and that's important piece of the evolution of IO, all that innovation in CMOS technology, as well as demand for our ubiquitous uh, video and cameras and so on, have, have driven tremendous, allowed us to implement tremendous information processing on a single die to the point where ultimately moving the information between chips is now becoming the bottleneck, right? So it's the bottleneck in terms of the, its energy consumption, it's consuming a large and growing fraction of overall energy consumption in these systems. Uh, in terms of the die area, you know, I mean, you can't do much compute if you're spending the whole die just moving bits on and off die. Um, in terms of our design effort, which is a big deal, it impacts time to market and impacts the cost of R&D, which is a big fraction of the cost of these systems. And it, it makes the thing, it's one of the riskiest parts of the design. I mean, uh, memory, digital logic, you know, there we have good flows, we have solid procedures for ensuring it'll work. High-speed I.O. remains a significant risk factor in a lot of these chips. Uh, it, can, it can cause yield fallout that impacts costs significantly and test time, right? So when these things are fabricated, even in volume production, some kind of testing has to perform on every single part. It has to be performed on every single part. And it actually takes a, a significant amount of time just to test the data going in and out of these chips. And that slows down the flow of the chips. It costs money. So fueled by increasing data traffic, you've seen here, see here a scatter plot that's a survey of publications from two of the leading conferences in this area, the International Solid State Circuits Conference and the VLSI Circuit Symposium over the last couple decades. Um, and you see this trend towards increasing data rate. Note that it's a, a log scale on the y-axis here versus linear scale for time. So you see this sort of generally the doubling of data rates every five years in support of all these trends we've been talking about. Um, and that is being coupled with, of course, Moore's law. So if we change the y the x-axis here now, to, instead of being year, we change it to process node, you still see something similar, right? You still see this kind of scaling of data rate with technology node. But I think an interesting thing, I, I like the, a different way I like to parse the data that's very instructive to me, just to understand how this has evolved over time is here I've still left process node as the x-axis, but I've changed the y-axis here to energy per bit or power efficiency on a log scale, um, by the way. And so what you see here is generally, you can visualize here an exponential improvement with process technology scaling and with time, but you see something, well, the reason I use process node here on this, this x-axis is to highlight something funny happened here a 28 nanometer. Again, this is the same survey of just published papers, combination of industry and academic papers here. Um, you see at the 28 nanometer node, um, a big spread of papers. And if you dig into the data there, what you see happened is that that was the first node where some of these works were making use of DSP-based transceivers. And the early adopters of that type of technology, by which I mean essentially implementing a complete modem for every single connection in and out of a chip, 
right? You've got like a modulator, a demodulator, digital logic, doing equalization and all that. Um, the people that first transitioned to that style of architecture in the 28 nanometer node paid a price in terms of their power efficiency. They were less power efficient. But that transition in architecture was necessary to enable this continued scaling, right? To, to allow us to continue to benefit from Moore's law scaling into the future. So you kind of see a sort of a funny note here where some people moved over, some people didn't to a DSP architecture, and then from there, the scaling continued until the present day, right? Power uh, efficiency continues to improve. So I think that's interesting to understand. So now we're in an era where DSP-based transceivers are ubiquitous um, for these very high-end connectivity applications. So the other trend that we talked a little bit about is this gradual transition from electrical cabling to optical cabling, and then gradually moving the optical cabling closer and closer to the packaging. So I'll step through these slides quickly here to make sure we have time for everything I want to talk about. But initially, you just had chips on separate boards talking to each other over a completely passive combination of printed wiring traces and copper cables. As data rates increased, the loss over that link became uh, untenable. So repeaters were added, essentially. Receivers and retransmitters were introduced. This adds cost and power but it allowed data rates to continue to increase and people start getting clever to try to allow data rates to continue to increase. Maybe we can use cables instead of the printed wiring traces. Maybe they can be engineered to have less crosstalk um, and progress continues. At some point, there's a motivation, depending on the reach, the combination of reach and data rate to use optics here. At this point, you need to do some optoelectronic conversion somewhere in the link. There is, I would argue, quite fundamentally some higher cost and power associated with optoelectronic conversion. If, if you're in a, a reach and data rate combination where you're, you're able to do it with a copper link, like reasonably, right? You just, you got to pay a price to convert back and forth to optoelectronics. But the challenge is at some point, the combination of reach and data rate just becomes impractical for copper links altogether. And then at that point, you bite the bullet and you start reaping benefits from using optics. Now again, here we're in the situation where we've got these annoying repeaters along the way. Can't we start moving those closer and closer to the endpoints of data? So the first step is to maybe move them onto the board, close to the chip. I would say this has been modest at best in its impact. The reason is, it's pretty simple, just by looking at the picture, you still got an electrical link there, unfortunately, right? Um, so you can save something, but you're just basically making the electrical link a little shorter. So the, the benefits um, have not been compelling enough to make a sea change, I would say, in the way systems are built. So then people are really looking forward to, okay, we've really just got to put the optics right next to the endpoints, right in the package. And even once you're there, there's lots of outstanding questions there. How do we do this? Do we just put many chiplets side by side, one of them doing optoelectronic conversion, another one maybe filled with amplifiers? And then you've got the main compute chip or networking chip there. Or can we stack some of these chips on top of each other and have a 3D chiplet kind of system? What do we do with the lasers? Do we bring those in the package? So I'll, I'll talk about some of these as we start looking at some of the different applications for co-packaged optics, which is what um, I want to do next. OK, so one main application for this co-packaged optics is where you've got a really large ASIC, application-specific IC, that's doing a lot of work. Uh, it could be a networking chip, GPU, AI accelerator, uh, just a general processor, whatever it is. This is a big digital chip doing a lot of, uh, crunching a lot of data one way or another. And therefore, it requires tremendous aggregate I.O. bandwidth, right? And, and just a growing amount going, going forward. So, in fact, if we start talking about feeding this chip, this ASIC, with 100 terabits per second, 200 terabits per second in and out of data, you've got a limited amount of wiring you can provide in and out of that ASIC. Uh, progress on that front in terms of the number of wires we can connect to it is, is, is modest at best. We can't rely on that. So the data rates are increasing 100, 200 gigabits per second per lane of traffic. And at those high data rates, just traversing this package and going down through its thickness and onto a board, even that's just becoming uh, a big hassle. 
So the idea is to integrate these miniature optoelectronic converters, optical engines, right on top of the package and, and obviate some of those losses. So that's the general picture. That's what co-packaged optics is. But there's a lot of a lot of different ways you can implement it. There's a lot of permutations here. So one that looks good uh, at first and, and has been of interest, some people say, okay, well, let's put in all the transceiver circuits on the ASIC, okay, and then just perform the optoelectronics, presumably with silicon photonics, on these separate chiplets that are co-packaged. Um, the, the problem there is this puts a heavy burden on this ASIC here, which, because it's a big data crunching chip, is going to have to be implemented in a very advanced nanoscale CMOS technology. You're asking that chip now to also house a bunch of t amplifiers with tens of gigahertz of bandwidth, which that those technologies are not really designed to do. Um, you're asking it to just do a bunch of work. And you, as a, you're back to that situation I mentioned before, you're spending half of this chip on just taking care of the IO. So not a, there's been not a lot of systems looking like this. Instead, you can, again, start making use of the chiplet paradigm here to say, okay, let's focus the ASIC on doing what it's good at, compute, memory, and so on and move the RF circuits onto these bar, these black bar chiplets here. And they're kind of a, a glue between the ASIC and the silicon photonics that do the optoelectronic conversion. It, this is again an example of the benefits of the chiplet design paradigm in that doing this allows us not only to free up space on the ASIC for more memory and compute, but also allows us to use a dedicated process for these amplifiers, a SIGI by CMOS process or something that's well tailored to those amplifiers. Another approach here is to go the next step and say, you know what, I'm gonna not just do that, I'm gonna put some of the other transceiver circuits on here as well. I'm gonna try and just reserve that middle ASIC. This is a cartoon I drew, but imagine the middle ASIC is still large, right? It's not quite to scale anymore. Um, and just reserve that whole chip for memory and compute and just put as little as I can on there. Put everything that has to do with shuttling bits in and out of the package, put it all on these chiplets. That's another uh, important approach. So the whole DSP-based transceiver resides over here on these chiplets. You still need some kind of die-to-die -die interface here, and that could rely on, for example, the new UCIE standard or something like it to communicate the data to the chiplets. But then on the chiplets, you've got all the equalization, all the data converters, all the functionality that's required to ensure robust optical links, as well as those amplifiers put on here. So that creates some trade-offs in here because now this chip is more complicated. There's a combination of analog, digital stuff on there. But again, it, the benefit here is it, it, it frees up as much area as possible on the main ASIC for digital compute and storage. Then you've got the final picture here where you have some silicon photonic technologies that allow you to integrate some CMOS transistors on it. So an example here is the 45 nanometer CMOS plus silicon photonics technology from Global Foundries, right? So this opens up another knob in optimizing the system, right? Well, maybe we should put some of these circuits over here onto that chip, onto the silicon photonics chip. So for example, there's a bunch of control circuitry needed to regulate the optics and make sure it stays uh, operating robustly across temperature and so on. Maybe some of that can be integrated on, on the silicon photonic chip. So you've got all these different trade-offs. Really, this is, an, I think, an illustration of the, the chiplet design paradigm and all the freedom for innovation that it opens up. It's quite likely that the optimal solution will depend on the end application. I just tried to highlight some of the trade-offs here. But I will say that most real systems being worked on and researched most heavily today are in categories B and C here. So, I mean, the simplest solution of those for co-packaged optics is to basically just take what people are doing today with the optoelectronic conversion at the edge of the boards and just take a very similar looking function and miniaturize it. Maybe silicon photonics helps you do that. Maybe a chiplet co-package design paradigm helps you do that. Just miniaturize it, stuff it in the package. Um, the problem is that this doesn't really do anything other than make things smaller, right? If you, if you literally just take all the same functionality, all the same DSP that was on the faceplate and just stuff it in the package, um, you haven't really saved any power. And in fact, you've concentrated the power into a smaller volume. So you may have made overheating a bigger problem. So this 
approach is now largely being abandoned in favor of a couple other approaches, which I've already touched on. I want to provide a little bit more detail on them here. So one is so-called direct drive co-packaged optics. So here you've got a, a combination of chiplets, let's call it. Here's the main ASIC. And the intention here is that the large ASIC houses on it all, all, all the circuitry needed to take care of transmit and receive functions except maybe for that last layer of amplifier that interfaces directly to the optoelectronics. So, um, and this is called direct drive because other than these amplifiers here, the main ASIC is more or less directly driving the optics. These are just very light analog circuits here. So this relies heavily on the on, on, on circuits that are integrated onto the ASIC, but the good thing is it allows for flexible packaging options. This is a big deal because imagine now that you've put everything you need in that ASIC, you can again start making use of the chiplet design paradigm to say, hmm, maybe I'll swap out uh, different optics here and the same ASIC will, will work with it. Maybe in fact, I'll forget the optics in one application and I'll just go out electrically because I'm only going a short distance anyway and an electrical link can handle it. And then I don't need to spend all this money for these extra optoelectronics and chiplets here. So it makes the ASIC more flexible, allows one ASIC to address a wider variety of situations. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a challenge here in that you need more circuitry here and it limits the density with which you can get data on and off this chip because you, you've got pretty relatively large complex transceivers on the ASIC. The alternative is being referred to as digital drive co-packaged optics. Um, so what this is referring to is making use of a really dense, low power, light die-to-die -die interface, which is usually wider, meaning more wires in parallel and operating at a lower data rate. That allows it to use simpler circuits that consume less power and allow it to, con to communicate more aggregate bandwidth between two chips while occupying less error, uh, area on the main ASIC, so frees up more area for compute and memory there, and, um, and takes up less of its power envelope as well. So it looks, looks more optimal overall, but with this type of die-to-die -die transceiver on the ASIC, you're only going a millimeter or two, right? So you're then, this is more of a tailored solution where you're coupling it with a chiplet that has a mating die-to-die -die interface on the other side, and then all this DSP-based transceiver that was integrated on the ASIC in this picture is now being pushed onto this chiplet here. So this is another, another paradigm, ultra low power and small area on the ASIC and, and also allows for a very high bandwidth density going in and out of the ASIC die, but it does create uh, other challenges as well. So again, it's gonna depend on, on the application, which is preferable. So where do we see co-packaged optics actually being used today? Some of the, the highest volume applications right now are actually not in these very big chips yet. Um, they're actually inside the pluggable modules themselves. These are the modules at the edge of the card that perform the optoelectronic conversion. There we're already seeing essentially co-packaged optics being used just to miniaturize what's inside of these, these plugs. So there's a paper from Intel just a couple weeks ago that provides some details about the integrated, they call it an integrated photonic engine. Again, that's the, or optical engine is the kind of terminology that's used for this thing. Essentially, this is a co-packaged thing combination of an electronic and silicon photonic chips and maybe some other stuff in there um, that is, uh, allows a very small form factor that can then be crammed inside a pluggable module. Um, so it's being used inside 800 gig modules for this purpose. It's also been used you know, in, in coherent optical data transmission as well, where you, again, there's a, there's a benefit there. There it's, it's being used for different motivations, not the ones I'm talking about, these large chips that need high aggregate traffic. It's just the flexibility allows for co-design and co-optimization is beneficial to the application. So this is good because it's sort of germinating co-packaged optics in general, creating the packaging technology that's needed, letting the industry figure out how to do fiber attach inside of these packages. Um, but really, mostly what I've been talking, where this is going is in these, some of these large chips. So, uh, and this is what is generating a lot of excitement, I would say, a lot of, a lot of chatter uh, in the research community. 
One type of large ASIC is a networking ASIC, like a switch. Broadcom made a lot of, um, you know, generate a lot of interest when they announced um, their co-packaged optical switch. So essentially they've got optoelectronic conversion arranged around the perimeter of this package, the main die in the middle, and then just fibers coming out, hundreds of fibers, in fact, coming out of this thing. They call their technology for doing that silicon photonic chiplets in a package or skip. That's a, a cool name. Intel even earlier announced a demonstration of something very similar, a switch with optical IO and Cisco just a couple of weeks ago made um, news at OFC by demonstrating something similar, which they call Silicon One. So that's a main application, classic example of sort of thing I've been talking about, big ASIC in the middle. You would love to just cram as much memory and, and, and processing on that main chip as possible. And, but it requ requires super high aggregate bandwidth in and out of it. Then this more emerging, interesting opportunity is in high performance compute, artificial intelligence, machine learning computation. Here, you know, there's also continuous increasing interconnect requirements driven, as I mentioned, in part and, and in a growing way by this, this disaggregated compute model that requires low latency and high bandwidth connectivity. So you see here, this is from a paper, a recent paper uh, from NVIDIA, actually published just a few weeks ago, highlighting some of these trends and they're, they're distinguishing between their Ethernet switches and their GPUs and some purpose-built switches uh, in between. And so you see a, a trend towards you know, increasing aggregate bandwidth for all of these. And interestingly, you know, what you see is GPUs sort of catching up to the other applications. So this is a trend that everyone's been foreseeing and anticipating and talking about for some time. At some point, these types of applications may outstrip the traditional networking applications in terms of their bandwidth requirements, and they may start driving R&D in this area. And they may, in fact, drive it in somewhat different directions because of the somewhat unique requirements uh, for them. They really, the reach is not as important, right, as, as say in a switch application where you may need to go hundreds of meters or even kilometers across a massive data center. You, so in, a, in an HPC AI ML application, the reach required may be much less, tens of meters. Low latency is super important, right? Because again, it's this disaggregated model for getting data from storage and memory. So those are some of the that's sort of the application landscape for some of this, some of these things. And so the next part of the talk, I want to talk about some of the opportunities and challenges. So let's talk first about CPU for these really large ASICs. We already talked about how you know a benefit that's motivating, that's a, just a really high level kind of obvious benefit that this promises is that it can eliminate the need for these retimers, this extra electrical hop in the data's long journey that I talked about. So that promises to lower overall system power, it can lower latency because every time you receive and retransmit, you introduce a little bit of latency. And there may be the potential to lower cost there. After all, if there's, a le if there's le uh, one less chip in, in the mix here, one less retransmitter, um, that should mean less cost, right? There's one less widget to buy. Um, it also offers the potential to improve aggregate I.O. bandwidth. The, the idea there is, look, optics have tremendous I.O. bandwidth potential in them, right? They're these amazing waveguides for tons of data. It's just a matter of harnessing them. That's, that's the challenge. But there's, there's a lot of challenges. First of all, we talked about moving these functions all into the same package concentrates a lot of power dissipation and therefore a lot of heat creation all in a small volume. And by the way, it's putting the largest single heat generator anywhere in the system, the main processing engine, the ASIC, right next to the components that are, some of the components anyway, that are likely to be the most temperature sensitive, uh, sensitive which are the optics. Um, so you may create challenges there uh, that have to be dealt with. Also, the assembly of this, this system over here, this is a snapshot I, I grabbed from the Cisco uh, Silicon One announcement, by the way. And just to give credit. <laughs> um, but you can imagine if you've got a switch with hundreds of fiber pigtails coming out of it, right? Someone's now got to go in there and connect every one of those and do it in a way that those links work. There's no dust, there's no... Now compare that with a, plug, a pluggable environment to basically someone sticking their fingers in one of these pink loops and pulling, right? And just popping a new one in. And if one of them breaks, 
you just send somebody in there and you do it. It's a big deal. It's a really big deal. And imagine you have one link that's a failure, right? And the diagnostic report is sent to the data center operator. What's somebody got to do now? Now you need someone that can actually pull this switch out. And by the way, when you do that, you're bringing down tons of compute. Any compute that's connected to it is, is impacted when you do that. Crack open the switch, go in there, start figuring out what's going I mean, this is, a comp this is a big difference compared to a pluggable environment where you know which link is down, you replace the plug. It's all good. This is a big deal for these people. Uh, field service, right? That's what I'm talking about there. And another important issue is that it actually restricts competition and concentrates optical link R&D into the, the companies that make the switches because now there's essentially the whole, the whole product is one chip. It's a chip made out of multiple chiplets, but the whole system is all integrated in there, right? In, in the current paradigm where we re most networking switches rely on pluggable optoelectronics, you can have a lot of different companies innovating on different pluggables and different technologies there and incorporating silicon photonics into them and different laser technologies and lowering power and, and competing there, right? There are very few companies that can build one of these 50T, 100T switches, right? Like you can count them on one hand. Um, and in this paradigm, those would be the same one, two, three, four companies would also be the only ones that could, would then be responsible for any R&D in optics, right? So it just increases the barrier innovation, probably slows progress in some areas. Um, so you could see uh, market dynamics playing out here, how this might be uh, challenging and beneficial for different companies. Okay. Another thing I want to talk about as a, as a challenge and opportunity here for co-packaged optics, this idea of bandwidth density. So we talked about the, the fundamental challenge at some level because the endpoints of data are, all, are always these silicon chips. At the end, it's like, how do you get data in and out of the edges of these chips? The chip size is limited by the manufacturing machines that we use, combination of that and the yield that's achievable just because of defects on the silicon wafer. The chip size is what it is, even for the largest chips. And so we are now often quantifying the performance of con connectivity in and out of a chip by what we're calling the bandwidth density or beachfront density. It's basic or sometimes it's called shoreline density. But the idea is how many gigabits or terabits per second can you communicate per millimeter of die edge? Now using a chiplet paradigm here, if you have two dies that are co-packaged and separated by a millimeter or even less, a very dense wiring that's implemented in a advanced packaging technology, you can get five terabits per second per millimeter of beachfront or even more. Uh, and here's a paper from, from February, just a month ago from uh, an author at Samsung that, that you know, highlights, that provides some numbers behind what's achievable here. And again, this is using the UCIE uh, standard data points he highlighted here in blue. This is a different standard called bunch of wires, but doing the same thing. But the bottom line is you've got multiple terabits per second per millimeter of each front density. That's enough to meet compute and processing demands actually for some time, right? Uh, if we, we, the packaging technology needs to evolve a bit to, to keep up with that. So that's good. It means that that bottleneck is being, is, is alleviated by this die to die link and, and other bottlenecks that are ending up limiting us in this regard. So that's good. The problem with co-packaged optics is, is that Typically, fibers are arranged sort of four fibers per millimeter. So if you want to keep up with this five terabits per second per millimeter of beachfront density that you can get in and out of the ASIC, you're going to have to send one terabit per second per fiber to keep up with that kind of beachfront density. Now, there are solutions. It's not so, so you, you will be bottleneck, you know, although ironically, one of the promises of CPO is alleviating you know, or addressing the challenge of aggregate bandwidth in and out of a chip, it can actually become a limit, right, in this, in this paradigm. That's not to say there are not solutions that are being heavily researched. You can, and, and some of them are just obvious, right? Well, maybe we can make this fiber array denser somehow. Um, maybe we can make use of multiple wavelengths per fiber, right? Or maybe you can adopt, so there's a paper that just came out from an author at NVIDIA that showed, yeah, I mean, one way uh, to approach this is to just basically do some fan out here and use a bigger package and start routing links a little further. Um, um, these die to die links then have to get longer and there's some R&D needed there perhaps, but th that's not to say that 
this is not insurmountable. It's just to say that there's a challenge there that's still being grappled with as to what's the, the right approach. Another interesting area where more innovation is going to continue, there's going to be more investment in R&D and more innovation is going to continue to reap uh, benefit is this idea of the, where should the laser go? One, and I would say currently the more prevailing philosophy is to make use of an external laser source, which means a laser that's not inside the package. Um, sometimes it's called ELS for short. Good things are it keeps the laser away from the heat producing ASIC. Laser is one of those things whose lifetime can be impacted by a lot of heat and high temperature. And there are even standards or at least multi-source agreements emerging for uh, external laser sources that allow them to be made pluggable. So they basically they put them in the same form factor as these pluggable modules, but they just put a laser there so that if a laser fails, you can again, someone go stick their finger in, pop out the plug and then replace the laser that way. So this is, uh, you know, allows it to be field replaceable and, and multi-sourced, right? You can get lasers from different providers that helps drive down cost. On the other hand, there are technologies that have been demonstrated and that are growing in maturity for integrating the laser inside the package or even integrating it directly on top of the silicon photonics. Um, this results in a very slick solution, obviously, that's highly integrated. It also offers the potential for lower coupling loss between the laser and the photonic, silicon photonic IC. Um, so interesting, right? And then in fact, because if the laser attachment is done in a robust way, some argue that it's, uh, that it's actually more robust and has better long-term reliability in spite of the extra heating there. So it's, 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 it'll be interesting to see how that, that plays out. Uh, but again, these are some of the trade-offs there. And um, I think it's going to be an evolution where um, you know, we're initially seeing solutions focused on an external laser source until integrated laser technology demonstrates its maturity. Okay, so finally, I'll just quickly want to talk a bit about optoelectronics and packaging co-optimization, because I think that's a really important opportunity for co-packaged optics. Once you've got all these things co-packaged side by side, you've got the opportunity to co-design them. And I said some of the existing applications of co-packaged optics, where they're being used inside pluggable modules for coherent and direct detection based optical links, this was really the main motivation by more tightly integrating these things and having them co-designed, um, you can get overall better performance or more functionality somehow in the system. Um, now in order to co-design this, the, the, the appropriate sort of knobs you have to play with in the co-design depend on the packaging technology you use. How are you going to put these, interconnect these different chiplets, let's call them on the same package, you can connect them with wire bonds and some uh, existing CPO for pluggables are implemented this way. You can flip chip these onto a common substrate. Now you're relying on wiring embedded in the packaging substrate to do the job. Um, you can start stacking these things and there's different ways to stack them. You can stack one on top of the other. Or, um, you can have the interconnect going a few different ways. It depends how you build these things up over time. Um, and each alternative is going to offer different trade-offs between signal integrity and cost. And with any of these, there's the not to be underestimated challenge of accurately coupling the fiber to the photonics with low loss. Um, so let me uh, jump around a little bit. I just want to highlight um, one project uh, that we've been working on here at the University of Toronto that's looking at this. Um, this was first authored by Drew. Yeah. There you go, right? Um, it's great, great work here. And um, essentially, the objective here was to co-design the package and the front end amplifier in an optical receiver um, to provide the best overall performance given a commercial photodiode. Um, so there's interesting opportunities to do that. It, basically, it's not obvious what should be the, the type of interconnect that's used in the package substrate. Should it be long and skinny? Should it be short and fat? There's pros and cons with each. And in fact, there's an optimization that can be a co-optimization that can be done between the shape of this interconnect and the analog front end circuits that are embedded on chip. So some of the on chip 
uh, inductors, coupled inductors into a T-coil, the front end of the trans impedance amplifier, the first stage amplifier. By co-designing the whole thing, you can achieve significant performance improvements overall. Um, and so this is leading us to look at an optimization framework here that Im implicates um, machine learning to help us do this complicated optimization uh, in an efficient way. So I think there's lots of work to, to be done there, but you can see the kind of benefits to be had there. These are some of the, the sweeps showing sweeping different types of interconnect with a given uh, analog front end design. And you can see you can achieve tremendous bandwidth improvement by co-designing these things properly, a factor of two or more. And uh, it was fun to look at the picture here. The thing. So this is what it looks like all put together. Right? There's a CMOS chip. In this case, it's flipped on top of a package substrate. Photodiodes, an array of them flipped as well, side by side, separated by a small fraction of a millimeter. And then interconnected, the transimpedance amplifiers live here. There's one here. There's a different photodiode. And these are um, sort of back illuminated here. Um, so picture of the testing here, right, showing the prototype. There's the photodiodes and the CMOS amplifier chip fiber coming in here and then the electrical output being measured uh, on the top of the package. So, so with that, I'll just jump to the concluding slide here and just point out that optical communication, again, takeaway points, continuing to see increasing use over shorter and shorter distances within data centers. And so these optics are moving closer and closer to the endpoints computation. And the natural evolution of that is to bring the optics inside the package. But although there's opportunities there, there's also significant challenges. So the exact timing when co-packaged optics is going to take hold is going to be different for different applications and is in many cases uncertain. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a betting person uh, on that front. But as it happens, I think that co-design and co-optimization of the optics packaging and analog circuits and the DSP as well is going to offer tremendous performance improvements. So as this happens, either the people doing these different parts of the system have to work closely together or, um, or you know, there's going to have to be some advanced tools uh, involved to help them get the job done properly. Um, and so these are just some uh, pictures showing that by co-optimizing the DSP alongside the analog circuits, alongside the packaging, we were able to demonstrate 160 gigabit per second transmission uh, over an analog circuit that only had 32 gigahertz of bandwidth, which is a little bit surprising, but it shows you the power of doing the co-optimization properly. You can do that. I just want to finish off acknowledging uh, Drew, Baha, I think I didn't mention Chris Lee, I should have uh, neglected that into the slide, all contributing to some of the work you saw here, and uh, Bez Edlagi, a colleague from AlphaWave that also contributed some of the figures as well.